Okay, we recently read several works by Matsuo Basho and a play, a Jōruri play by the great Edo period dramatist Chikamatsu Monzaimon. So I thought as a supplement I would read to you the following uh, passages from the world's first serious uh, historian or scholar of Japanese literature, W. G. Aston, the British diplomat, author and scholar, expert in the language and history of Japan and Korea, born in 1848, died in 1911, and in 1899 he published his A History of Japanese Literature, which was the first systematic or comprehensive uh, story or history of Japanese literature from antiquity to up until the late Edo period, I think, is where his, his history ends. I will provide the link to that book in the link in the description, in the description, and I will read now his section on Shikamatsu, followed by his section on Matsu Basho and Haikai poetry and Haibun prose poetry or prose of the Edo period. Okay, here is what he says about Shikamatsu, the popular drama, Shikamatsu. It would not be quite correct to say that the popular drama owed nothing to the no, but it certainly followed a different and independent line of development. Its literary progenitors, the Taiheiki, which it may be remembered, was chanted or recited in public by men who made this their profession. The Taiheiki was followed by more or less dramatic stories, which were recited by a single person seated before a desk to the accompaniment of taps of a fan to mark the time or to give emphasis. To this was subsequently added the music of the shamisen, a three-stringed guitar recently introduced from Lu Cho. A favorite story for this purpose was the Jōruri Jiu Ni Dan Soshi, written towards the end of the Muromachi period. It relates the loves of the famous Yoshitsune with a heroine whose name, Jōruri, is now used as a synonym for a whole class of dramatic compositions. Towards the middle of the 17th century, we hear of Jōruri Katari, chanters of Jōruri, at Yedo, for whom two authors named Oka Seibe and Yonomiya Yajiro are said to have written a number of pieces, some of which, known as Kompira Bon, are still in existence. They relate the adventures of a hero named Kompira, nine feet two inches high, with a face so red that nothing could be redder, whose doughty deeds in quelling demons and slaying savage beasts are still the delight of the Japanese schoolboy. The first Kabuki Shibai, or popular theater, as distinguished from the No Shibai, and from the Ayatsuri Shibai, or marionette theater, is said to have been established at Kyoto, Kyoto early in the 17th century. We are told that a priestess of the great temple of Kizuki in Izumo, named Okuni, having made the acquaintance of one Nagoya Sanzaburo, ran away with him to Kyoto. There they got together a number of dancing girls and gave performances on the bank of the river Kamo, where the theatre street stands at the present day. Okuni, as a priestess, would naturally be acquainted with the pantomimic dances, pantomimic dances performed in honour of the Shinto gods, and was doubtless herself a trained dancer and mime. Owing to certain abuses, the employment of women as actors was put to a stop, put a stop to by the authorities. Their place was taken by boys, but this also was eventually prohibited. A marionette theater was next established. In 1661, it was transferred to Osaka, where it was famous in subsequent dramatic history as the Takemoto Za. The marionette theater is still popular in Japan. The puppets are elaborate contrivances fitted with machinery for rolling the eyeballs, raising the eyebrows, opening and closing the mouth, moving the fingers so as to trap, as to grasp and flirt a fan, and so on. The popularity of the Takemoto Za procured its several rivals, the most celebrated of which is the Toyo Take Za. The fame of the Takemoto Za was chiefly owing to the genius of Chikamatsu Monzaimon, who is unquestionably the most prominent figure in the history of the Japanese drama. The birthplace of this remarkable man has been as much disputed as that of Homer. The most probable statement is that he was a samurai of Hagi in Choshu where he was born in 1653. It is said that his boy, in his boyhood he became a priest. 
He himself tells us that he was a retainer of more than one noble house in Kyoto. For some reason his services ceased and he became a ronin. The ronin, that is, a samurai who has been dismissed for misconduct, or whose indocile temper has found the severe discipline of the Yashiki irksome beyond endurance, is a very familiar personage during the Yedo period of Japanese history, not only in fiction but in real life. Countless deeds of desperate courage and many atrocious crimes are related of them, among which may be mentioned the well-known revenge of the 47 Ronins and their subsequent suicide, and the murderous attacks on the British legation in 1861 and 1862. In the early days of foreign intercourse with Japan, Ronin was a word of fear to all quiet, law-abiding people. It is significant that the principal playwright, as well as, as well as the most eminent novelist, Baking, of this period should both belong to the ranks of these hommes de classe. After leaving the service of the Kyoto nobles, Chikamatsu wrote a number of stories and pieces of no great merit for dramatic per performance at Kyoto. One of these was formally attributed to Saikaku, one of these formerly attributed to Saikaku is the Kaijin Yashima, which bears traces of a study of the older no drama in Kyogen. Its subject is an episode in the life of Yoshitsune. Chikamatsu's earliest dated work was written in 1685. In 1690 he took up his residence in Osaka, where his connection with the Takemoto Marionette Theatre began. From this time until his death in 1724, he produced in rapid succession a number of dramas which, whatever their faults, leave no doubt of his possessing a fertile and inventive genius. On a superficial, superficial examination of one of Chikamatsu's plays, a European reader might fail to recognize the fact that it is a drama at all, and take it for a romance with rather more than the usual proportion of dialogue. All the Jōruri contain a large narrative element of a more or less poetical character. This part of the play is chanted to music by a chorus seated on a platform overlooking the stage on the spectator's right, where also the persons sit who declaim the speeches of the po puppet actors. It is the narrative part which is more especially designated by the term Jōruri. The character which recites it, it is the true successor of the Jōruri Katari, or dramatic reciters above men mentioned, and is the nucleus of the whole, the dialogue being at first merely subsidiary. It not only supplies the thread of story to connect the scenes represented by the puppets on the stage, but aids the imagination of the audience by describing expressions of countenance, scenery, and much more than that the resources of a theatre, and especially of a marionette theatre, fail to convey. On closer examination, however, it becomes apparent that Chikamatsu's works are not really romances, but stage plays. They have a well-marked movement of plot from the opening scene up to the final catastrophe. They abound in dramatic situations, and many of the scenes are obviously designed with a view to spectacular effect. These things were new in Japan, and to Chikamatsu therefore belongs to the the, belongs the credit of being the creator of the Japanese drama. Chikamatsu's plays are classified by the Japanese as Jidai Mono, or historical plays, and Sewa Mono, or dramas of life and manners. With the exception of a few in three acts, there are all plays of five acts, but whether the choice of this consecrated number had anything to do with the fact that the Dutch were in the habit of visiting the theatres of Kyoto and Osaka on their per periodical journals, journeys to Yedo to pay their respects to the Shogun, I have not been able to ascertain. Nor is it possible to verify a suspicion that the arrangements of the Japanese popular theatre, with its capacious pit and, al and galleries, and a stage well furnished with scenery, trapdoors, turntables, as in ancient Greece, and other appliances, may owe something to hints given by these visitors. In these respects, the Japanese popular theatre is certainly far in advance of any other in Asia, and more particularly of the no Shibai above described. Chikamatsu was a, volum a, vol a volumni voluminous, voluminous writer. The modern edition of his selected works comprises 51 plays and runs to more than 2,000 closely printed pages. 
He is credited with the authorship of, his, of as many more. Each is of about the same length as one of Shakespeare's plays, so that they constitute a truly formidable bulk of literary matter. The novelist Kyoden tells us that a three-act piece of his called Nagamachi Onna Harakiri, the women's Harakiri, a gruesome title, was written in a single night, and the statement, whether true or not, bears testimony to the opinion entertained by his countrymen of his facility of composition. His works deal with all manner of subjects. They show that he was well acquainted with the Shinto and Buddhist religions, and that he possessed a wide and varied knowledge of the history and institutions of Japan and China. Of Chikamatsu's merits as a dramatist and poet, it behooves a European writer to speak with some degree of reserve, more especially as it is impossible to read more than a tithe of his works. The admiration of his own countrymen for him is unbounded, some of them going so far as to compare him with Shakespeare. It is certainly possible to trace resemblances. Both in Shakespeare and Chikamatsu, comedy frequently treads on the heels of tragedy. In both, Prose is intermixed with poetry, and an exalted style of diction suited to monarchs and nobles alternates with the speech of the common people. Both divided their attention between historical and other dramas. Both possessed the fullest command of the resources of their respective languages, and both are tainted with a grosser element which is rejected by the more refined taste of later times. It may be added that neither Shakespeare nor Chikamatsu is classical in the sense in which we apply that term to Sophocles or Racine. Chikamatsu in particular is very far removed indeed from the classical type. But few such comparisons have any value, and it is really idle to compare Shakespeare with a writer whose portraiture of character is rudimentary whose incidents are outrageously extravagant and improbable, whose philosophy of life is wholly wanting in originality or depth, and who is constantly introducing scenes brutal and revolting to agree a degree inconceivable to the Western mind. Of this last blemish, his audiences must share the responsibility. Nothing seems to have given greater pleasure to these smug, unwarlike shopmen and mecha mechanics with their womankind, no samurai with any res self-respect ever entered a theatre, than sanguinary combats and scenes of torture, suicide and murder. They love to have their blood curdled and their flesh made to creep, and Chikamatsu, like other writers of his day, took care to supply this demand in no stinted measure. Defects like these are only partially compensated for by a certain barbaric vigour and luxuriance which undoubtedly distinguishes his works. That such a writer should hold the position of the prince of Japanese dramatists only shows by what an imperfect standard this art is judged in Japan. It is difficult for a Western reader to understand the esteem in which Chikamatsu is held by his countrymen as a poet. In that part of his plays which is, ch which is chanted to music by the chorus, we may, it is true, find meter, rhythmical cadence, fit language, and play of fancy, but all in a very modest degree. The met metrical form adopted by him is the usual alternation of seven and five syllable phrases, which is even less substantial than our ordinary blank verse, or the irregular unrhymed lines favoured by Sothe. Nor does he adhere strictly even to this. Longer or shorter lines are introduced from time to time for no other apparent reason than the author's con convenience. The, rhythm, the rhythmical quality of his poetry is unmistakable, but for reasons already pointed out, the Japanese language does not lend itself to any but the simplest harmonies of this kind. A more serious blemish is the abundant use of pivot words and other meretricious ornaments, which are fatal to coherent sense and destructive to grammar. The general result is seldom such as to satisfy a European taste. It will nevertheless, I think, be found that Chikamatsu's poetry, with all its faults, occupies an important place in the history of Japanese literature. The writers of No had done something to extend the domain of the poetic art beyond the narrow limits prescribed by tradition. Chikamatsu continued their work and took possession of, if he failed to reclaim, 
large tracts of subject matter which had been neglected by his predecessors. The older poetry may be compared to a trim garden of a few yards square. Chikamatsu's jewelry resembles a wide clearing in a forest where the products of a rude agriculture are seen growing among tree stumps and jungle. Chikamatsu's most famous play is one which is entitled Kokusenya Kasseng, 1715, or the Battles of Kokusenya. Kokusenya, called Kokushinsha by older Koksinga, by older European writers on Japan, was a famous pirate, the son of a Chinese by a Japanese mother, who played a considerable part in the wars of the last days of the Ming dynasty in China. As this is considered the masterpiece of the greatest of Japanese dramatists, it seems desirable to give an analysis of it here. Act 1. The scene opens at the court of Nanking. The last of the Ming emperors is seen surrounded by his ministers. An envoy from the king of Tartary appears, bringing rich presents which are piled up in the courtyard. He makes a speech in which, on behalf of his master, he asks for Kwase, Kase, the, famous, the favorite concubine of the emperor, so that he may make her his queen and thus cement friendship between the two powers. The emperor and his court are much disturbed by this proposal, as Kase was just then expected to give birth to an heir to the Ming throne. A traitorous minister named Ri Toten urges its acceptance. General Go Sanke rushes forward and protests indignantly, indignantly, ordering the Tartar king's presence to be taken away. The Tartar Envoy replies with spirit and is about to fling out of the imperial presence when Ri Toten strives to pacify him. To enforce his appeal, he digs out his own left eye with a dagger and hands it on an ivory slab to the envoy, who receives it with respect and accepts it in satisfaction for Go Sanke's insult to his sovereign and himself. The envoy takes his departure. The next scene is in the apartment of the emperor's younger sister. The emperor appears accompanied by 200 youthful inmates of his harem, half of whom bear branches of flowering plum and half of cherry. They draw up on each side of the stage. The emperor tells his sister of Ri Toten's noble self-sacrifice and again urges the latter's suit for the hand of the princess, which had previously been rejected by her, suggesting that her answer should depend on the result of a battle between the Plum and Cherry squadrons of ladies. The princess agrees to this and puts herself at the head of the Plum party, who, acting in collusion with the emperor, allow themselves to be defeated. Go Sanke now rushes in, clad in full armor, and with his lance drives off both squadrons. He remonstrates with the emperor for setting an example in the palace which, if followed by the people, would lead to disastrous civil tumults charges Ri Toten with treachery, and by an elaborate analysis of the Chinese written character for Ming, the name of the dynasty, proves that Li Toten's digging out his eye was merely a private signal to the Tartar envoy that the time was ripe for the execution of their treacherous schemes. The emperor scoffs at this learned sophistry and kicks Go Sanke on the forehead with his imperial foot. From all sides there now comes a sound of conches, drums and battle shouts. The Tartars have arrived and, surrounding, and are surrounding the palace. The general rides into the courtyard. He tells the emperor that the Tartar king's love for Kase was all a pretense, and that his real object was the destruction of the unborn heir to the Ming throne. He avows Di Toten's treacherous complicity and announces to Go Sanke his intention of carrying off the emperor and Kase as prisoners and of making them serve as menials in his master's kitchen. Go Sanke's wife, Ryuka, now appears with an infant in her arms. She flies with the princess by a postern gate, leaving her child behind. Go Sanke makes a sally and with 100 men drives off several millions of the enemy. In his absence, Li Toten's younger brother, Li Kaiho, murders the emperor, cuts off his head, and binds Kase. Go Sanke returns, cleaves Li Kaiho in two, 
releases Kase and reverently sets up the emperor's headless trunk, which he adorns with the hereditary regalia. While he is hesitating whether to save the emperor's body or the pregnant consort Kase, the enemy renew their attack. Having beaten them off, he resolves to save the unborn heir to the throne and to abandon the corpse. Meanwhile, his own infant child begins to cry for his natural nourishment. What a nuisance, he exclaims. But on second thoughts, he reflects that the child is his own heir and that it would be on the whole better to save him. So he binds him firmly to the shaft of his spear and retreats to the seashore with Kase, pursued by the enemy. Kase is killed by a bullet and Go Sanke by an improvised Caesarean operation, Soram Popilo, rescues her living child, a beautiful boy, which he wraps in his dead mother's sleeve. But stay! If the enemy find that the child is gone, they will spare no pains to discover it. So he stabs his own child, who, it may be remembered, was all this time lashed to the shaft of his spear and substitutes it for the infant, infant priest. Exit Go Sanke. Enter Go Sanke's wife with the princess. They hide among the reeds by the seashore. A Tartar officer named Godatze follows in pursuit. He takes a small boat and searches all the creeks near them. Diuka, Go Sanke's wife, catches his oar and overturns his boat. He goes to the bottom and Diuka gets into the boat with the princess. Godatze comes up from below all dripping and a combat ensues in which Godatze has his head cut off by Ryuka. Then, as in her bedraggled and blood-stained condition she is no fit company for a princess, she shoves off the boat containing the latter, which is carried away by the wind and tide and remains behind on the shore. The chorus describes the situation in poetical <coughs> imagery. <coughs> Act 2. The scene changes to Hirado in Japan. Cook Senya, with his wife, is gathering shellfish on the seashore when a small boat approaches. It proves to contain the princess who had drifted over from China. Kokusenya's wife, a low vulgar woman who provides the comic element of the play, is overcome with laughter at the Chinese which the princess and her husband talk. Jealousy, uh, talk. Jealousy then gets the upper hand, but this gives way to respect when she learns the rank of the stranger. Kokusenya, who is the son of, the tr of a trusted minister of the Ming emperors, makes up his mind to restore that dynasty and proceeds with his father and mother to China, leaving the princess in his wife's charge. On arriving there, they resolve to seek the assistance of Kanki, a Chinese magnate who had married a sister of Kokin Kokusenya. While traveling through a forest on their way to his castle, Kokusenya bearing his aged mother on his back, they fall in with a tiger. Disdaining to use his sword against the beast, Kokusenya gains the mastery over him after a struggle which doubtless gave much gratification to the groundlings of the Osaka Theatre. A hunting party arrives. Their leader claims the tiger for Ri Toten, the traitorous one-eyed minister of the first act. Kokusenya replies in a style of inimitable braggadocio. With the tiger's assistance, he subdues the huntsmen and forms of them the nucleus of an army which, with which to conquer the Tartar invaders. Kokusenya's first care is to cut off the pigtails of his recruits and to give them new names, in which Japanese terminations are stuck onto names indicative of their foreign origin. One of these names is Igidisu Be, English Be. We may well wonder what an Englishman was doing dans cette galère. Act 3. Kokusenya, at the head of his newly recruited force, arrives before Kanki's castle, but he is absent and they are refused admittance. The old mother, however, is permitted to enter in the guise of a prisoner bound with her cords. Kanki returns. The old woman begs him earnestly to espouse her son Kokusenya's cause. He forthwith draws his sword and tries to kill his wife, 
but is prevented. He then explains that he has not suddenly gone mad, but that if he joined Kokusenya, people would say he was influenced by women. So it was necessary to remove his wife as a preliminary to granting her request. His wife being still alive, this was impossible. News of this refusal being conveyed to Kokusenya, he bounds over the moat and parapet of the castle and presents himself before Kanki. After mutual Homeric defiance, they prepare to fight when Kanki's wife exposes her breast, showing that in order to remove all obstacle to the plans of her husband and brother, she has given herself a death wound. The two then fraternize, and a quantity of warlike gear is produced in which Kokusenya is clad, his mother looking on with great admiration. She then commits suicide, enjoining on her son and Kanki to show no weakness in fighting against the Tartars, but to regard them as the enemies of mother and wife. She dies with a smile on her face, gazing at the gallant appearance of Kokusenya in the new armor supplied him by Kanki. Act 4 We now return to Go Sanke who at the end of the first act had retired to a secluded place among the hills with the heir to the Ming throne. Here follows a Rip Van Winkle episode, at the end of which Go Sanke finds that the young prince has become a boy of seven, whose voice sounds to him like the first song of the nightingale heard in some secluded valley where the snow still lies. Kokusenya's father now appears upon the scene accompanied by Kokusenya's wife and the princess, who have come over from Japan. Whilst they are giving mutual explanations, the enemy had come in chase, but the gods having been prayed to, a cloud issues from a cave and forms a bridge, over which they cross an abyss to the mountain on the other side. The enemy attempt to follow, but the bridge is blown away by a puff of wind. The five hundred foes tumble to the bottom and are crushed to pieces. Act 5. Kanki, Kokusenya and Gosanke hold a grand council of war, at which the most impossible nonsense is talked. A letter arrives from Kokusenya's father, stating that finding life at his age 73 not worth living, he is about to find death in the enemy's ranks. The three, full of determination to save him, rush off to Nanking, now the Tartar king's stronghold. The scene changes to Nanking. Kokuseya's father appears before the gate and challenges Ri Toten to single combat. The Tartar king is seen on the battlements, but his order, by his order the old man is seized and brought into the city. Kokuseya and his party appear before the walls. Ri Toten tells Kokuseya that he must choose between his father committing Harakiri or they're both going back to Japan. Consternation of Kokusenya and his party. Speech by Kokusenya's father, reminding him of his mother's dying injunctions, and adjuring him not to think of his fate. Kokusenya is about to spring at the Tata king, but is deterred by Ritoten putting his sword to the old man's throat. Go Sanke now throws himself at the feet of the Tartar king, offering to give up Kokusenya if the lives of the two were spared. No sooner has the Tartar king granted this request than Go Sanke springs at him, knocks him over, and binds him. Kokusenya also rushes forward, releases his father, and seizes Ri Toten. The Tartar king has 500 blows of a bamboo administered to him and is sent off a prisoner to Japan. Ri Toten's head is wrenched off there and then, and the play ends amid general rejoicing. A summary of this kind gives too much prominence to the defects of this most famous of Japanese dramas. Its manner is better than its matter. There is a copious flow of sonorous and often picaresque, picturesque language of exalted sentiment and sententious oratory, which divert the readers, and still more the audience's, attention from the improbabilities of the story. The personages do and say many absurd things. 
Yet they speak and bear themselves in a manner not altogether unworthy of tragic heroes. It may be added that even in this maddest moods, Chikamatsu never neglects dramatic force of situation, and that he has a turn for impressive dialogue which ought not to be ignored. Dullness is not among the numerous faults of the Koku Senya Kassen. The European reader is not likely to relish the more poetical passages of this drama, with their pivot words and closely woven elusive phrases, yet possibly there is more in them than we are willing to acknowledge. The Japanese find them the choicest part of the work, and they might not unreasonably deny to foreigners the right to sit in judgment upon the finer raptures of their national muse. As a poet, Chikamatsu may readily be allowed one merit. If Japan ever produces epic, dramatic, or long narrative poems of importance, he will have done much to prepare the way. The popularity of the Kokusenya Kasseng with the audiences of Osaka was so great as to call for two continuations in the same style, and it is still one of the stock pieces of the Japanese theatre. Chapter 4. Poetry of the 17th century. Haikai, Haibun, and Kyoka. Haikai. It might naturally be, be supposed that in the tanka of 31 syllable po syllables poetry had reached syllables, poetry had reached its extreme limit of brevity and conciseness. But a still further step remained to be taken in this direction. In the 16th century, a kind of poem known as Haikai which consists of 17 syllables only, made its appearance. The haikai is a tanka minus the concluding four syllables. This is all incorrect, by the way, so don't take it seriously. That's my little note. Uh, and is, at, and much of his commentary about shikamatsu too is uh, incorrect, I must say. The haikai is a tanka minus the concluding 14 syllables, and is made up of three phase, phrases of five, seven, and five syllables, respectively, as in the following. Furuike ya, kawazu tobikomu, mizu no oto. It differs from tanka, however, in more than meter, being much less choice in diction and matter than the older kind of poetry. It admits words of Chinese derivation and colloquial expressions, and often deals with subjects which the more fastidious Tanka refuses to meddle with. The earliest professor of this accomplishment was Yamazaki Sokang, a Buddhist priest, 1445-1534. to 1534. The verses of his which I have met with have mostly a comic character, here is one. Even in the rain, come forth, O midnight moon, but first put on your hat. A halo is called in Japanese kasa, which also means a broad hat or umbrella. Another early haikai writer was Arakida Moritake. The following is from his poem, from his pen. Thought I the fallen flowers are returning to their branch, but lo, they were butterflies. Coming down to the Yedo period, the first name of note in this departure of literature is that of Matsunaga Teitoka, 1562-1645. A well-known haikai of his is the following. For all men tis the seed of siesta, the autumn moon. In other words, the autumn moon is so beautiful that people sit up half the night to gaze on it, and have therefore to make up for their want of sleep by a siesta on the following day. If it were not, however, for the fame of Matsuda Basho, it should be Matsuo, of course, it's a typo in the book, Matsuda Basho, 1643-1694, and his disciples, it would hardly be necessary to notice this kind of composition at all. He imported a more serious element, 
and greatly refined and improved the Haikai until it became a formidable rival to the Tanka. The latter had in these days become too exclusive for the popular taste. The Fujiwara family, who were its special patrons, practicers and critics, maintained the traditional canons of their art in all their rigidity, and the nation was glad of a new and more unconfined field for its poetical talent. To write tolerable tanka required a technical training, for which the many had neither time nor opportunity, but there was nothing to prevent any one with ordinary cleverness in the smattering of education from composing haikai. Saikaku, an unlearned man, is said to have produced 20,000 stanzas of this kind of poetry during one day's visit to the shrine of Sumiyoshi, and to have received on that account of the cognomen, cognomen of the 20,000 old man. The story is an obvious exaggeration, but it shows what an easy thing haikai writing was thought to be. Basso belonged to a samurai family, hereditary retainers of the daimyo of Tsu, in the province of Ise. He acquitted himself with credit in an, un of, in an official capacity connected with waterworks in Yedo, but for some reason threw up his appointment and entered the Buddhist priesthood. He built himself a cottage in the Fukagawa pr pr district of Yedo and planted a banana tree beside the window. It grew up and flourished, and from it he took the name Basho Banana, by which he is known to posterity. He was a diligent student of the Zen Buddhist doctrines and of Taoism, and was also an artist. From time to time he took long excursions to the remotest parts of Japan, leaving behind him traces of his presence, which remain to this day in the shape of stones inscribed with poems of his composition. On one of these journeys he took suddenly ill and died at Osaka in the 51st year of his age. Shote Kinsei relates the following incident which happened on one of Bosho's tours. It illustrates the favour in which Haikai was held even by the lowest classes of the people. Once, when on his travels, Basho passed through a law through a certain rural district, making haikai as he went along. It was full moon. The whole sky was flooded with light, so that it was clearer than noonday. It was so bright that Basho did not think of seeing an inn, seeking an inn, but continued his journey. In a certain village, he came upon a party of men who had brought out sake and something to eat with it into the open air and were enjoying the moonlight. Basho stood still to watch them. Presently they failed to compose in Haikai. Basho was greatly pleased to see that this elegant accomplishment was practiced even in so remote a place, and continued looking on when a silly fellow of the party noticed him and said, There is a priest who looks like a pilgrim. He may be a begging priest, but never mind, let us invite him to join us. They all thought this would be great fun. Basho could not refuse, so he joined their circle, taking the lowest seat. The silly fellow then said to him, Everybody here is bound to compose something about the full moon. You must compose something too. Basho apologized. He said he was a humble individual belonging to a country place. How should he presume to contribute to the entertainment of the honorable company? He begged, therefore, that they would kindly excuse him. No, no, said they, we can't excuse you. Good or bad, you must compose one verse at least. They urged him until at last he consented. Basho smiled, folded his arms, and turning to the clerk of the party, said, Well, I will give you one. Twas the new moon. The new moon? What a fool the priest is, cried one. The poem should be about the full moon. Let him go on, said another. It will be all the more fun. So they gathered around and mocked and laughed at him. Basho paid no attention but went on. T'was the new moon. Since then I waited. And lo, tonight I have my reward. The whole party was amazed. 
They took their seats again and said, Sir, you can be no common priest to write such a remarkable verse. May we ask your name? Basho Smilini replied, My name is Basho, and I am traveling about on a pilgrimage for the sake of practicing the art of Haikai. The rustics, in great excitement, apologized for their rudeness to an eminent man whose fragrant name was known to all the world. They sent for their friends who were interested in Haikai and began their alfresco feast anew in his honor. It has been objected that Haikai, even in the hands of an acknowledged master like Basho, is too narrow in its compass to have any value as literature. The Kangaksha Dazai Kshuntai calls it a Tstanaki Mono, a stupid sort of thing, and Shote Kinsi admits that in the eyes of the superior man, this is doubtless so. Its popularity, however, is undeniable. The name of Basho was known to the very cowherds. He had ten disciples, and they in turn had pupils whose name is Legion. Monthly conferences of Haikai amateurs were held regularly both in the capital and the provinces, and there were professors who contrived to make a living by practicing this art. It would be absurd to put forward any serious claim on behalf of Haikai to an important position in literature, yet, granted the form, it is difficult to see how more could be made of it than Basho has done. It is not only the meter which distinguishes these tiny effusions from prose. There is in them a perfection of apt phrase which often enshrines minute but genuine pearls of true sentiment or pretty fancy. Specks even of wisdom and piety may sometimes be discerned upon slow, close scrutiny. Suggestiveness is their most distinctive quality, as may be seen by the following. A cloud of flowers. Is the bell ueno or asaksa? To the English reader this will appear bold and even meaningless. But to an inhabitant of Yedo it conveys more than meets the ear. It carries him away to a, his favorite pleasure sort, resort of Mukojima, with its long lines of cherry trees ranged by the bank of the river Sumida, and the famous temples of Ueno and Asakusa in the vicinity. He will have no difficulty in, in expanding it into something of this kind. The cherry flowers in Mukozima are blossoming in such profusion as to form a cloud which shuts out the prospect. Whether the bell which is sounding from the distance is that of the temple of Ueno or of Asaksa, I am unable to determine. But brevis os laborat obscurus fit. A very large proportion of Basho's haikai are so obscurely elusive as to transcend the comprehension of the uninitiated foreigner. The following are some of the more lucid. The same quality of suggestiveness pervades them all. An ancient pond, with a sound from the water of the frog as it plunges in. I come weary. In search of an inn, ah, these wisteria flowers, ah, the waving Lespediza, Lespediza, which spills not a drop of the clear dew. Tis the first snow, just enough to bend the gladiolus leaves of Midera, the gate I would knock at, the moon of today. That is to say, how beautiful the scenery about the Temple of Midera must look on a fine moonlight night like this. I would that I were there to see it. On a withered branch, a crow is sitting this autumn eve. The cry of the cicada gives no sign that presently it will die. The following are by other writers. Tis the cuckoo. Listen well. 
how much soever gods ye be. Tis the first snow, yet someone is indoors. Who can it be? The club shakers rising and falling in the water until it becomes a mosquito. The water grub, which subsequently becomes a mosquito, moves about by the rapid vibration of its tail, hence the name club shaker. To the Japanese it is an emblem of the mischievous boy who is destined to develop into a wicked man. O oh, ye fallen leaves, there are far more of you than ever I saw growing on the trees. Alas, the width of this mosquito net which meets my eye when I awake and when I lie down. The following characteristic specimen of this kind of poetry is quoted in Mr. B. H. Chamberlain's Handbook of Colloquial Japanese, Asagao ni Tsurube Tordarete Mordai Mizu. Literally, having had my will bucket taken away by the convolvuli gift water. The meaning, as Mr. Chamberlain not unnecessarily explains, is this. The poetess Chio, having gone to her well one morning to draw water, found that some tendrils of the convolvulus had twined themselves around the rope. As a poetess and a woman of taste, she could, know she could not bring herself to disturb the dainty blossoms. So, leaving her own well to the convolvulus, she went and begged water of a neighbour. A pretty little vignette, vignette surely, and expressed in five words. Highboon. The highboon is a kind of prose composition which may be conveniently mentioned here as it is a sort of satellite of the haikai, and aims at the same conciseness and sub suggestiveness. The most noted, noted writer of highboon is Yokoi Yayu a high official of Nagoya, in Owari. He is the author of the much-admired apologue which follows. An earthen vessel, whether it be square or round, strives to adapt to its own form the thing which it contains. A bag does not insist on preserving its own shape, but conforms itself to that which is put into it. Full, it reaches above men's shoulders. Empty, it is folded up and hidden in the bosom. How the cloth bag which knows the freedom of fullness and emptiness must laugh at the word world contained within the jar. O oh, thou bag of moon and flowers, whose form is ever changing. In other words, how much better it is to yield our hearts to the manifold influences of external nature, like the moon and flowers, which are always changing their aspect with the weather and the season, than self-concentrated to try to make everything conform to one's own narrow standard. And I don't think he mentions it, but I think this was a reference to the Lao Tzu. That's my little footnote for that. Okay, next section, Kyoka. Lao Tzu. Hmm. Kyoka. Literally, mad poetry. Kyoka, of course, Kyoka. Literally mad poetry, mad cat poetry, I think is Adam Kern's term for this. Kyoka is a comic and vulgar variety of tanka. There is here an absolute freedom both in respect to language and choice of subject. The kyoka must be funny, that is all. In this kind of poetry, of which an immense quantity was produced during the Yedo period, the punning propensity of the Japanese has been allowed full scope. Shade, pr pronounced shere, reigns there supreme. Share is one of those numerous Japanese words for which there is no exact English equivalent. It may be translated wit, but in order to express its full meaning, a spice of what is comprehended under the terms gaiete, esprit, playful fancy, stylishness, must be added. Japanese wit, like that of other countries, has an element which defies analysis or classification. But the jeu de mots Predominant. Share infests not only the kyoka, but the drama and fiction, to an extent well nigh intolerable to European tastes. 
Dr. Florenz, professor of philology in the Imperial University of Tokyo, has treated this subject with truly German conscientiousness, conscientiousness and erudition in a paper read before the German Asiatic Society of Japan in 1892. Following a native investigator named Tsuchiko Kaneshiro, he classifies Shade under two heads with divisions and subdivisions, making in all 20 different kinds. Our old enemy, the pivot word, is here, also the pillow word, and several varieties of the ordinary pun with various fearfully complicated acrobatic contortions of speech which I shall not attempt to describe. Even the reader who has a competent knowledge of the language requires a special study to understand and appreciate them. He follows these Far Eastern waggeries with a halting step, and frequently finds himself in the position of the Scotchman who was heard suddenly to burst into laughter at a joke which had been made half an hour before. Nothing testifies more strikingly to the nimbleness of the Japanese apprehension than their delight in these Taschenspiele Kunsten des sprachlichen Ausdrucks linguistic pre, pre, prestidigitations. Linguistic prestidigitations. Prestidigitations, as Dr. Florence has aptly called them, whether in conversion or in books. It may be doubted whether such an excessive fondness for mere verbal wit does not amount to a disease, and whether it has not constituted a serious obstacle to the development of higher qualities in their literature. In quite recent times, a popular kind of lyrical poetry has come into fashion which somewhat resembles the ancient Naga Uta in form. The following may serve as a specimen. Vain has been the dream in which I thought that we met. Awake, I find myself again in the darkness of the wretched reality. Whether I try to hope or give way to gloomy thought, truly for my heart there is no relief. If this is such a miserable world that I may not meet there, thee, oh, let me take up my abode deep in the far mountains. And deeper still, in their furthest depths, where, careless of men's gaze, I may think of my love.